All right, two. Oh, uh, let's just go one, two. Hey, everybody, the ancient game of Ur, an ancient game that was popular but then lost to the ages because they didn't have Board Game Geek to keep track of things. And then uh, rediscovered by a museum curator who was diligent in putting this all together and now recreated in 3D printing by a collaborative effort of designers from across the world into, I think, a rather nifty little box that can keep all the components in it. Man, I'll tell you what, I love this stuff. Hey everybody, it's the 3D Printing Professor, and while I'm talking here, I'm going to really quickly pull up uh, a time lapse of the board that you just saw being printed. So let's talk a little bit about what this whole project is. So for those of you who haven't seen the video that I have right here, I will put a card on my head right here that you can go watch it if you want. But this is a video of Irving Finkel, a man with a beard that makes other beards blush, <laughs> uh, and the curator of the British Museum, who has deciphered the, the uh, rules, or rather recreated the rules, from this old cuneiform tablet. Uh, it didn't have the complete rules, but he figured it out, uh, put all the pieces together, and recreated this game of Ur. And when I saw this video, I was immediately interested, uh, not just because it was cool, because it is, but because a, a project that I had worked on before, Tardis Run, has a lot of similarities to this game, even though I used a different ancient game as the basis for this game, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. You can see that time lapse going on there and, and uh, somewhere in the print, a roll of filament fell off my shelf and knocked down the glue stick. I just, I live in a constant mess. Um, but yeah, it's going on. Now, the cool thing about this set, I, I, am, I saw this and I immediately thought I need to 3D print this. And I had in my mind this folding set with the box inside of it that all folds and prints in one piece, but the, the designs of the pieces on the front, the, the, the board pieces, were daunting, to say the least. And while I was thinking in my head, well, how am I going to tackle that? Am I going to use the technique that I used with my son, creating a 2D drawing and then putting it onto 3D, which you can look at here, uh, another card for you to watch. But nevertheless, uh, uh, while I'm sitting here humming and hawing about how I'm going to do it, uh, Thingiverse user Malgui. His name is Robert. I'm gonna give it a shot, buddy. Uh, Iniston. Iniston. He actually made it. He did it, and 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 he got it out there. And even better, he made it in two parts. It's like he was reading my mind about what I wanted to do with this. So I grabbed the whole thing and I took it into Blender, and I put the two parts uh, into each other and cut out holes and put a hinge. And I took this second part here and uh, made sure that there was plenty of space. Now I want to talk about about these overhangs here. You see, in, in, in the time lapse that you're watching there, everything has to print without supports. And without supports, these corners would have been uh, a pain. So I, I took the model and I just, I just moved this corner down, but then I, I didn't know where this corner was going to go, whether it was going to go this way or this way. So I triangulated that you know, now distorted polygon, and I controlled which way that went to make it so that th when this prints, it kind of creates its own support up from the side at a nice 45 degree angle that it's happy with. Now on the top here, instead of having a nice flat shelf, even though some printers might be able to handle that bridging, I made it a nice gradient so that this wouldn't be a problem. So the whole thing prints, each of the parts separately print without needing supports. Um, and then they nestle together and these two hinges come very close to touching each other, but they do not actually touch. They remain separate. And that's kind of the trick to these print in place hinges is that they just, they just brush up against each other without actually touching so that after you're done printing and we're coming up to the end of the print over here, after this print is finished, and this print finished for me about midnight or something, but after it finished, all you had to do was pop it off the build plate, open it up, and it printed well. 
and I was I was rather pleased with the whole thing when it was done. And you can go to uh, Thingiverse and download my version of it right here. So I'm just trying to I'm just trying to vamp until the end of the print here. But let's uh, as soon as that print finishes down there, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump over to back to the board, and we're going to talk a little bit about the similarities and differences between Ur and TARDIS Run and why those similarities and differences are there, okay? So there's the print done, pop it off the bill plate, and it opens up. It hardly needs any cleanup whatsoever. So cool. So here, here's TARDIS Run, and let me just get these components out of the way. And here is Ur. Okay. And TARDIS Run, uh, just like Ur, I, I designed it to have all the pieces inside of it. And I want to make a slightly bigger TARDIS Run board. But notice the dice in Ur, okay? Tom, Tom Scott noticed this in the video that he recorded, but these dice, they're four-sided dice with pips on two sides, which means that they are statistically no different than rolling uh, flipping a coin because there's there's basically two possibilities two out of four of the possibilities are going to be yes and two out of four of them are no so it's it's a coin flip it's one out of two if you reduce that variable down and in TARDIS run that was actually the idea that started the whole thing see there's another ancient board game called Senate which if you ask me probably has some some root relationship to them in Senate, they found paddles, and the paddles were colored on one side, but blank on the other side. And the theory was that they threw these paddles, counted up the number of sides that came up, and used that as your move. And when I saw this, and Tom Scott saw the same thing in Ur, I re immediately realized this is a very uneven distribution. See, if you roll a six-sided dice, the chance of any side coming up one, two, three, or four is is relatively even, okay? But if you roll two six-sided dice, all of a sudden the chances become uneven. There's more of a chance that you're gonna roll a seven versus rolling like a 12 or a two. You can't obviously roll a one because there's no zero dice, but the lowest you could roll would be a two, and there's only one way to do that, snake eyes. And there's only one way to roll 12, it's double sixes. But there are lots of ways to roll a seven. Well, same with this game. Uh, because of the different paddles, there are different probabilities of things going up. Now, I, I immediately started playing with this with TARDIS Run, and I made some paddles with two and some paddles with one, so that the most common possibility with these three paddles is actually three, whereas in Ur, the most common possibility is going to be two. The other thing that I did was uh, the, the, the distribution curve between these two games is fairly pyramid, actually, uh, but it's fairly smooth. I also added this black paddle in the game, and the idea behind the black paddle is that it's got a, a dot on one side, and it's got times two on the other side, and that screws with this probability curve, because if it comes up with this, then it that goes along that pyramid curve, but if you get the times two, it makes it so that inside this pyramid curve is another pyramid curve which is way higher, and the two of them work against each other so that you can't tell what's going on. And my idea in making this game was that I wanted to say, okay, well, what you'll do is you'll have your pieces on the board, and you will choose who moves, and then roll the dice, uh, or throw the throw the paddles uh, to decide how they move. The idea is you could choose who your agent is, but you can't tell them what to do. You can't control what they're going to do. And I played that version, and it turned out to be less fun to play. It's more fun when you get to control things like this. But uh, the way that we play Ur is like that. And there are other games, Sorry, Parcheesi, a lot of other games that have a similar mechanic. Now, in Ur... The pieces start on the same side, and then they run together down the middle and split off. And in TARDIS Run, I looked at the board of Senate, and I thought, these guys are running into each other. And so one side starts here, and they go around this way, and one side starts here, and they go around this way. And I've added these little spots on the board that you can 
you can shortcut through if you land on them exactly so that adds a little aspect of something's happening uh, in Ur over here there are lots of different patterns on the board there's these Rosetta patterns which uh, you know Irving Finkel has determined uh, is is a uh, uh, get a free move square and that's cool but what are the rest of these these five pattern turns up a lot and these these four patterns that, that uh, Robert has, has indicated with eyes turn up a lot they, they have repeating patterns so I went out to try and find the rules and I found the official rules by the British Museum that includes uh, uh, the the rules for the extended version of this game that he found on that cuneiform tablet it does not say anything about what to do with these special spaces so that's still out there there are lots of house rules that people have made up about what to do with them there's some people who say that on this square if you've got a piece on there and your opponent lands on that piece he, he doesn't kick you off but he stacks on top of you in fact you can stack five high on here but the only one who can move off is the top one so you can essentially sit on an opponent's piece and keep him from moving and then maybe he'll come along and say fine i'm taking control of this square too and nobody's moving until i decide to move and it can go back and forth for a while so it's a rather interesting idea i like that house rule and i may add that to my play i'm not going to link to those rules because i'm not entirely sure that the british museum wanted those rules out so uh we're going to just leave those where they're at uh, but if you want to, uh, a Google search can find them. But for the extended rules, we needed to have different pawns. Instead of these little pawns with five on them, they had little pawns with birds on them, and each bird had different values. And I thought, oh, forget the birds. Let's just let's just take the back side of these pawns, and let's give them different values. So here we've got uh, pawns with a one, two, three, four, and five, and you can only get these pawns to enter the board by rolling a one, two, three, four, and then the five is a wild card, you can get it in, but then you gotta get them out of the way so that the right one can get in. Uh, and then there are additional rules that involve paying your opponents if you, if you uh, jump over them. So if you don't take a piece, but if you actually jump over it, you have a penalty and you have to pay them and you can gain stuff, so we need some currency. And, so I added these to the download. Uh, may I suggest that your currency is now diamonds. <laughs> uh, it's safe to say that Old Spice and Isaiah Mustafa has had a significant impact on my psyche. But still, there we go. And there's plenty of room inside this board for all of these pieces, uh, the dice, and easily 40 of these diamonds. I could probably get even more of them in there. But in this way, the game becomes kind of a betting game. And so, you know, if you like that, if it's interesting to you, uh, if it's something that, that sounds like you want to check it out, I recommend you go find those rules. But all the components that you need to play it are here, and they're available for download. So go ahead and hit the description for that. Uh, I'll get the recipes in here real fast. There we go. See, look at that. Plenty plenty of space in here and then it, it's even got little latches on it to keep it from opening but if you want to you can put a rubber band around it to make sure that it doesn't open and then it sits on your shelf like that until you're ready to play everything self-contained if I can make a small set of the rules to fit in there it would be complete I think that's pretty cool I hope you think that that's pretty cool anyways I hope that you'll check out the game of Ver and check out TARDIS run if you want uh, thank you Robert for for putting together the initial version so that uh, uh, you, you help me kickstart this. And I love that he's in, in Manchester and I'm here in America and we were able to share information and get this happening. This is why 3D printing is so cool. Uh, if you like the Game of Burr and you want to thank Irving Finkel for doing that, I will search for a link to see if you can make a, a small donation to the British Museum just to say, hey, thanks for that. And then download and print and play your own version of the Game of Burr and just have fun with your friends. It's, it's a great game. Anyways, as always, I thank you very much for watching. Safety first. I'll see you next time.